Hi everybody. So, I have a bit of a policy. If more than 12 people write to me independently on a subject asking for a video, well, I'll make the video. And this video is about the Thunderstorm Generator by Malcolm Bendel. I guess it had some publicity somewhere because a lot of people have written to me. But before we get into Malcolm's invention, what I want to do is remind you of this. It's the Geep processor by Paul Pantone that he developed in 1987 and in 1998 got a patent on. If we look at it, we can see some remarkable similarities, but let's have a listen to what Paul says about it. Utah inventor Paul Pantone has developed what he calls the Geet fuel processor, a plasma generator similar to a super carburetor that actually appears to run on 80% water and is entirely non-polluting. This device replaces the carburetor and exhaust and combines them as one unit, whereas this end of it acts as a miniature refinery, allowing the engine to run on everything from battery acid and water mixed to crude oil right out of the ground. The exhaust coming down goes around and comes out here at the far end. The center chamber draws some of the heat from the exhaust Plus, this tube takes some of the exhaust gases, takes them up into the chamber, and bubbles them down to the bottom. The bubbles, as it comes through the fuel, are brought up to the top of the chamber, picked up through a tube, and fed up the center of the exhaust pipe. While they're being fed up the exhaust pipe, they are in a vacuum, and there's a heat exchange which occurs. This process has been argumented argued a few times to be either a plasma field, an electro field. Paul passed away in 2015 and that was after spending some time in prison on two counts of security fraud that he pled guilty to. Then they moved him to a mental home and he was eventually released. But put all in that aside, what I really want you to notice is what he described his machine as, that is a plasma based generator, and what the structure of it was, that is one tube inside another. Now let's have a look at Malcolm's machine. So here's the machine itself. It's composed of three parts. There's an ionization chamber that the air enters through by the pull of the vacuum of the engine. There's a, a bubbler, although they don't call it that. They call it, I think it's the plasmoid generator. And then there's the generator section itself, which is the red bone like thing here. Let's have a better look at it. The first bit is what they call their air ionization chamber. It really is just a chamber in which you put a UV light bulb. They recommend a 25 watt by 300 nanometers UV light bulb that is mostly used to keep lizards warm. You stick that in the chamber and the air is sucked through by the vacuum of the engine and it's supposed to ionize it as it passes through. So the bubbler or the plasmoid generator, it's basically just a tube filled with about one and a half liters of water and at the bottom there's a stone you actually buy these for uh, fish tanks, aquariums, I think, and they are bubblers. So they bubble the pre-ionized gas through them. Uh, I think it's on the piston upstroke, and on the downstroke, then these bubbles are supposed to collapse, and that's where the plasmoids are formed. And then, of course, the engine's repeating, and the vacuum is drawing all of this stuff into the... Um, actual thunderstorm generator section itself. If we look at the drawing, what we'll see are two tubes, one nested inside the other in exactly the same way that Pantone did. But instead of having elbow joints like Paul, what we've got here are these spheres, which are referred to as flow guides. The basic machine is, as I say, one pipe slid inside another pipe. The big deal seems to be about the spheres and the sphere arrangement. These spheres nest inside each other, and there are three of them. The inner yellow sphere actually isn't apparently strictly necessary, just acts as an inner flow guide, and that has a little bit of uh, oh, a prong welded onto it so it can sit in the center of the blue sphere. The blue sphere allows the uh, pipe to go in and out, and the yellow is supposed to act as a flow guide, and then the red sphere encloses that, so the whole thing makes a joint. To put that together, when we have the yellow spheres first, these are apparently our two inch spheres, we put a support on those spheres and weld those inside the blue spheres, which are apparently three inch spheres. At the end of those spheres, we put on a spigot so we can actually join it to something. 
And then between those, another pipe. The red spheres go on and the red pipe goes on. The red pipe slid on before you put the blue pipe on, clearly, otherwise you won't get it to fit. And that replicates the drawing. Then all we actually do is put the um, unions on so that they will go to the exhaust and that's the device finished. So with the exception of the spherical joints and the addition of this UV ionisation chamber, I would say that this is pretty much a replication of Paul Pantone. I mean they have changed the name instead of calling it a plasma generator it's called a plasmoid generator. I suppose OID may call the difference but when I look at it I'm pretty much convinced that this is the geek processor that has been dressed up a little bit. So the big question could this actually work? Well, let's have a look at it in parts. Let's take this UV ionization chamber to start with. Now, the recommended thing to put in there is a 25 watt lamp and the UV range is 300 nanometers. So the problem with it being an air ionizer is UV is renowned as being a non-ionizing radiation. It won't ionize anything. So the air in there isn't going to get ionized. It's 25 watts is also a piddling amount of power. So the only thing that would happen with the ionization chamber is if you put a lizard in there, it would get slightly warm. A plasmoid is a plasma held together in a coherent shape by an external magnetic or electrostatic force. A plasma is just a group of charged particles, so a lot of electrons will form a plasma and an example of that is lightning. A lot of ions will form a plasma and an example of that is the sun. But basically you need two things, you need ions and you need something to hold them together in terms of a magnetic force and an electrostatic force. If you have those two things, then you can form a plasmoid at room temperature. Clearly, none of those things are present in the bubbler, but luckily there is another way to form a plasmoid. You form a plasmoid in a liquid if you subject it to extreme hydrodynamic shear. This happens all the time. It happens in ship propellers. When you have a body of water and you put a large shear force on it, it will pull the water apart. Not the water molecules, the water mass, a bit like, oh, ripping a, a stocking. It'll pull that apart and create a micro bubble inside of which there is a vacuum. The pressure of the water around will then collapse that bubble, imploding it, and a plasmoid will form. And of course, this is what they're saying happens inside that bubbler. And you have to ask yourself the question, are those conditions present? Well, what's the driving force? Well, the driving force is the vacuum from the engine. The vacuum from the engine is basically pulling the ionized air, which we've discovered isn't ionized. So of course, a question would be, how much is that pressure? Because the manifold pressure is the pressure that's driving the whole system. And it turns out in the average car, the manifold pressure is somewhere between four and 10 PSI, which is piddling. When you suck on a straw, you do it at one to two PSI. Your squeeze pressure is about 70 pounds in men and about 44 pounds in women. So you could squeeze the thing harder than the manifold pressure is exerting. It's not an awful lot of force. So we've got some air being bubbled through and basically bubbling through in the same way that your fizzy drink does with a pressure applied to it of round about what a couple of people could do with straws. There's not a lot of energy in there that's going to account for cavitation and implosion. The Thunderstorm device itself has been compared to a rank Hilsch tube and rank Hilsch tubes do work. They're astounding devices that separate hot and cold just from the flow of a gas forming vortexes inside the tube. The issue is, well, they need 80 to 110 PSI to actually work and what they've got is four. So vortexes are not going to form under those conditions. It's a well-studded effect. What's going to happen is that the fuel mixture, which has been wet by its passage through the bubbler, that is, it's carrying a bit of moisture with it, is going to be drawn up the inner tube. Of course, the outer tube is connected to the exhaust, so that's going to be warming that mixture as it's injected into the engine. And then that is exactly what happened in the Pantone device. Now, here is one of the shames of this thing. It's a bit of a shame because that actually works.
Bats. It was used as far back as the 1920s and studied extensively in the 1930s, finding widespread use throughout the war. Chrysler brought out a car in 1976 as a production version of it and you don't need all this gubbins, you don't need to have um, UV ionisation, a bubbler doing cavitation, a rank hills tube with vortexes, all you actually need to do is stick a tube in your inlet manifold and the vacuum pressure of the engine will take care of the rest and it actually works. It works by cooling the engine down a little bit at ignition and that means you get a leaner fuel, a better burn, lowered emissions both of carbon monoxide and nitrous oxides. You also get a fuel performance and it performs more or less twice. Now, why aren't we using this all of the time? Well, we aren't using it all of the time because it has a serious drawback. Remember we talked about the whole system being run by the vacuum pressure at the manifold? Well, that varies. When the engine is under no load, then that vacuum pressure is at its highest. But when it's under load, of course, you want more fuel going in there. In fact, the vacuum pressure is at its lowest. And so it's heavily dependent on load as to what kind of in performance you're going to get. Of course, an aircraft is under constant load and so it can be tuned. But a motor vehicle is under widely variable load. And so the overall benefit you get from it is negligible. Even though if you run an engine, you'll get twice the performance as long as it's not under load. Well, I suppose the big question is, does it work? Well, that depends what you mean. If you mean, does the injection of water into an internal combustion engine improve performance, decrease emissions within limits, the answer is yes, it does. But that's been known about for a hundred years plus. The main limitation was the vacuum control, but of course, with electronic control and injectors, it's being revisited right now to see if engines and performance can be improved by injecting water into them in a controlled manner. It's an active area of research. If you mean, does celestial mathematics, plasmoid cavitation, vortex tubes, transmutation of carbon into oxygen, does that all work? Well, to be honest, that's actually a question of what you believe in. And for that, I'm going to leave you on your own. I have my own ideas, but you no doubt have yours. Is a thunderstorm generator a new machine? Well, to be honest, I don't think so. I think he's taken the work of Pantone and built around it, probably sufficiently to obviate Pantone's patent, but I don't think it's new per se. I think it's a, a, an older idea that has found resurgence. And why would anybody do it? Well, that answer is really simple. There's money in them there hills, and that will motivate a lot of people to do a lot of things. Now, I don't know Malcolm or very much about him particularly, but I would suggest that a look into the man's history and character might be more revealing about his motivations than perhaps he would like. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.